There wasn't really any suggestion or any any talk about legislation currently pending in in Congress. Again, the only, the only time the Congress really was was mentioned, well, there were a couple of times, DACA, and then on the bump stocks. All right, we are going to be going inside the White House uh, to hear the discussion that the president had with the nation's governor. Incredibly important discussion: gun control, school safety. Some of the remarks that are already coming in is that the president intends to make recommendations known soon. If Congress doesn't ban bump stocks, he will. This conversation is a huge one because the president has been adamant about seeking out help at the state and local levels to tackle this problem. We're now two weeks out from that school shooting last week, but we've been hearing from some of the survivors today, including one little girl, Junior, at that high school, Maddie, earlier today, saying she'll make a full recovery. The president looking to make decisions on this soon. Let's listen to President Trump at the White House. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Rick. Thank you very much. And I want to thank our Vice President for that really lovely introduction. That was very nice, Mike, and I appreciate it. This is a time of great opportunity for our country. We've created nearly 3 million jobs since the election, a number that nobody would have thought possible. You go back and take a look at what they were saying just prior to the election. Nobody thought it was even possible. And we've done many other things, as you know, and I won't go over them because I want to be hearing from you today. But many other things that, frankly, nobody thought possible. GDP, 3.2, 3, 3. I think we're going to have another really big one coming up this current quarter. Uh, maybe a number that nobody would have thought would ever be hit, but I think we're going to have a very good number because of the stimulus, because of the massive tax cuts that we're all benefiting, whether you're Republican or Democrat, you're benefiting tremendously from those tax cuts. Apple's investing $350 billion in the United States, and you look at what's going on, it's, it's really quite something. Uh, you just read a week ago, Exxon is now coming in with $50 billion, and many, many companies also something that nobody expected. They're also coming in with massive bonuses for their workers. Nobody thought in terms of that. We know that everybody's going to get a lot more income, and we've seen that as of February 1st. Everyone's saying, wow, I have an extra $250 in my paycheck, and that's pretty good stuff. So we knew that was going to happen. We didn't know that hundreds and hundreds of companies, millions and millions of people were going to be getting large bonuses because of what we did. And one of the things we're working on is fair and reciprocal trade deals. We're not being treated fairly. You as governors are not being treated fairly. And when I get too tough with a country, you're always calling, oh, gee, don't do that. But I must say, it's more senators and congressmen and women that call. You haven't been calling so much. You want to see great deals. But we have to make the deals fair. You know, with Mexico as an example, we probably lose $130 billion a year. Now, for years, I've been saying, for the last year and a half, I've been saying $71 billion, but it's really not. And they have a VAT tax of 16 percent, and we don't have a tax. And at some point, we have to get stronger and smarter, because we cannot continue to lose that kind of money with one country. We lose a lot with Canada. People don't know it. Canada is very smooth. They have you believe that it's wonderful, and it is for them. Not wonderful for us, it's wonderful for them. So we have to start showing that we know what we're doing. World Trade Organization, a catastrophe. China became strong. You look at it. It was going like this for years and years and hundreds of years. It was going just like this. I'm a great, I have great respect for President Xi, by the way. So I'm not blaming them. I'm not blaming Mexico. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm blaming us because we did such a poor job for so many years. I'm not just talking about President Obama. I'm talking about many, many, many presidents for 30 years, 35 years. But World Trade Organization makes it almost impossible for us to do good business. We lose the cases. We don't have the judges. 
We have a minority of judges. It's almost as bad as the Ninth Circuit. Nothing's as bad as the Ninth Circuit, but it's almost as bad. Speaking of that, DACA is going to be put back into the Ninth Circuit. You know, we tried to get it uh, moved quickly because we'd like to help DACA. I think everybody in this room wants to help with DACA. But the Supreme Court just ruled that it has to go through the normal channel, so it's going back in. And uh, there won't be any surprise. I mean, it's really sad when every single case filed against us is in the Ninth Circuit. We lose, we lose, we lose, and then we do fine in the Supreme Court. But what does that tell you about our court system? It's a very, very sad thing. So Doc is going back, and we'll see what happens from there. So we want fair trade deals. We want reciprocal trade deals. Uh, Scott Walker has a wonderful company called Harley Davidson in Wisconsin, right? Great. So when they send a motorcycle to India, as an example, they have to pay 100% tax, 100%. Now, the Prime Minister, who I think is a fantastic man, called me the other day. He said, we are lowering it to 50%. I said, okay, but so far we're getting nothing. So we get nothing, he gets 50, and they think we're doing, like they're doing us a favor. That's not a favor. And you know what I'm talking about. It's a great company. When I spoke with your chairman or the president of Harley, they weren't even asking for it because they've been ripped off with trade so long that they were surprised that I brought it up. I'm the one that's pushing it more than they are. But it's unfair. And India sells us a lot of motorbikes. So when they have a motorbike, a big number, by the way, they have a company that does a lot of business. So they have a motorcycle or a motorbike that comes into our country. The number is zero. We get zero. They get 100%. Brought down to 75, brought down now to 50. Okay. And I wasn't sure. He said it so beautifully. He's a beautiful man. And he said, I just want to inform you that we have reduced it to 75, but we have further reduced it to 50. And I said, huh, what do I say? Am I supposed to be thrilled? And that's not good for you people, especially as, as governors. It's just, not, it's just not right. And we have many deals like that. Now, with all of that being said, let's talk China. Because China, we probably lost $504 billion last year on trade. $504 billion. I think that President Xi is unique. He's helping us with North Korea, who, by the way, wants to talk. As of last night, you heard that. They want to talk. And we want to talk also only under the right conditions. Otherwise, we're not talking. You know, they've been talking for 25 years other presidents should have solved this problem long before I got here. And they've been talking for 25 years. And you know what happened? Nothing. The Clinton administration spent billions and billions of dollars. They gave them billions. They built things for them. They went out of their way, and the day after the agreement was signed, they started. They continued with nuclear research. It was horrible. The Bush administration did nothing, both. The Obama administration wanted to do something. He told me it's the single biggest problem. It's easier in those days than it is now. I think most people understand that. But we've been very tough with them. China's been good, but they haven't been great. China has really... Um, done more probably than they've ever done because of my relationship. We have a very good relationship. But President Xi is for China, and I'm for the United States. And Russia is behaving badly because Russia is sending in what China is taking out. So China is doing pretty good numbers, but Russia is now sending a lot of stuff in. But I think they want to see it come to an end also. I think everybody does. Talking about tremendous potential loss of lives, numbers that nobody's ever even contemplated, never thought of. So they want to talk, first time. They want to talk. And we'll see what happens. That's my attitude. We'll see what happens. But something has to be done. Today, I want to hear your ideas on a number of critical issues. But most importantly, we want to discuss the public safety in schools and public safety generally. 
but school safety. We can't have this go on. I'm grateful that Governor Rick Scott is here, and we thank him for his leadership in the aftermath of the terrible tragedy in Parkland, Florida. Horrible. Our nation is heartbroken. We continue to mourn the loss of so many precious, innocent young lives. These are incredible people. I visited a lot of them. But we'll turn our grief into action. We have to have action. We don't have any action. It happens. A week goes by. Let's keep talking. Another week goes by. We keep talking. Two months go by. All of a sudden, everybody is off to the next subject. Then when it happens again, everybody's angry, and let's start talking again. We got we to gotta stop. By the way, bump stocks, we're writing that out. I'm writing that out myself. I don't care if Congress does it or not. I'm writing it out myself, okay? You put it into the machine gun category, which is what it is. It becomes essentially a machine gun, and nobody's going to be able. It's going to be very hard to get them. So we're writing out bump stocks. But we have to take steps to harden our schools so that they're less vulnerable to attack. This includes allowing well-trained and certified school personnel to carry concealed firearm. It's, at some point, you need volume. Now, I don't know that a school is going to be able to hire 100 security guards that are armed. Plus, you know, I got to watch some deputy sheriffs performing this weekend. They weren't exactly uh, Medal of Honor winners, all right? The way they performed was, frankly, disgusting. They were listening to what was going on. The one in particular, he was then, he was early. Then you had three others that probably a similar deal a little bit later, but a similar kind of a thing. You know, I really believe, you don't know until you test it, but I think I, I really believe I'd run in there even if I didn't have a weapon. And I think most of the people in this room would have done that too, because I know most of you. But the way they performed was, was really a disgrace. Second, we must confront the issue of mental health. And, and here is the best example of mental health. This kid had 39 red flags. They should have known. They did know. They didn't do anything about it. That was really man. But between the people that didn't go into that school and protect those lives and the fact that this should have been solved long before it happened, pretty sad. So we have to confront the issue, and we have to discuss mental health, and we have to do something about it. You know, in the old days, we had mental institutions. You had a lot of them. And you could nab somebody like this, because, you know, they did. They knew he was, something was off. You had to know that. People were calling all over the place. But you used to be able to bring him into a mental institution, and hopefully he gets help or whatever. But he's off the streets. You can't arrest him, I guess, because he hasn't done anything, but you know he's like a boiler ready to explode, right? So he's, he just, you have to do something. But you can't put him in jail, I guess, because he hasn't done anything. But in the old days, you'd put him into a mental institution. And we had them in New York, and our government started closing them because of cost. And we're going to have to start talking about mental institutions, because a lot of the folks in this room closed their mental institutions also. So we have no halfway. We have nothing between a prison and leaving him at his house, which we can't do anymore. So I think you folks have to start thinking about that. Third, we have to improve our early warning response system so that when friends, family, and neighbors do warn the authorities about a violent or dangerous individual, action is taken quickly and decisively. Look, you had the one mother, if you remember, in Connecticut. That's how horrible that was. She was begging, begging to take her son in and help him do something, anything. He's so dangerous, and nobody really listened to her. And he ended up killing her. And then the rest, you know what happened? It was a horror. But she was begging to do something about her own son. Recently, you had a grandmother that got to see the notes of her grandchild, and she reported him. And they nabbed him. He was ready to go in for a school, it looked like. She reported him. And there, the law enforcement did a very good job. Fourth, we must pursue common sense measures that protect the constitutional rights of law-abiding Americans while keeping guns out of the hands of those who pose a threat to themselves and to others. 
And fifth, we must strive to create a culture in our country that cherishes life and condemns violence and embraces dignity. Now, with all of that, over the weekend, I cannot believe the press didn't find this out. I can't believe it. I think they're getting a little bit, I could never use the word lazy. You don't want to say that. We don't want to give them any more enthusiasm than they already have. But I can't believe they didn't figure this one. Because I had lunch with Wayne LaPierre, Chris Cox, and David Lehman of the NRA. And I want to tell you, they want to do something. And I said, fellas, we got to do something. It's too long now. We got to do something. And we're going to do very strong background checks. Very strong. We got to do background checks. If we see a sicko, I don't want him having a gun. And, you know, I know there was a time when anybody could have. I mean, even if they were sick, they were fighting. And I said, fellas, we can't do it anymore. And there's no bigger fan of the Second Amendment than me, and there's no bigger fan of the NRA. And these guys are great patriots. They're great people. And they want to do something. They're going to do something. And they're going to do it, I think, quickly. I think they want to see it. But we don't want to have sick people having the right to have a gun. Plus, when we see somebody is sick like this guy, when the police went to see him, they didn't do a good job. But they have restrictions on what they can do. We got to give them immediate access to taking those guns away so that they don't just leave and he sit there with seven different weapons. Got to give them immediate access. Don't worry, you're not going to get any. You won't. Don't worry about the NRA. They're on our side. You guys, half of you are so afraid of the NRA. There's nothing to be afraid of. And you know what? If they're not with you, we have to fight them every once in a while. That's okay. They're doing what they think is right. I will tell you, they are doing what they think is right. But sometimes we're going to have to be very tough and we're going to have to fight them. But we need strong background checks. For a long period of time, people resisted that. But now people, I think, are really into it. And John Cornyn, great guy, Senator, Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan, and Kevin McCarthy, hopefully are going to work on some legislation. I hope you guys, they started already. In fact, John has legislation in. We're going to strengthen it. We're going to make it more pertinent to what we're discussing. But he's already started the process. We've already started it. And the other thing, we need hardened sites. We have to have hardened sites. So just in concluding, um, we have tremendous things happening. The country is doing well, and then we have a setback like this that's so heart-wrenching. So heart-wrenching. And we have, to, we have to clean it up. We have to straighten it out. You know, it's wonderful that we're setting records on the economy. We're setting records. Black unemployment at an all-time historical low. Hispanic unemployment at a historical low. Women unemployment at an 18-year low. 18 years. And actually, I did very well with women during the election. Nobody wants to give me credit for that, as you know. But eight, and I'm very proud of that. To me, these are incredible statistics. And very importantly, we're doing, our companies are doing well. The fundamentals are beyond what, literally beyond what anyone's ever seen. This isn't a bubble. You know, there was bubbles in the past because these companies were valued and nobody understood where, where's the money? Where's the money? And these are really strong companies we're building now. We have tremendous underlying value. I want to bring the steel industry back into our country. If that takes tariffs, let them take tariffs, okay? Maybe it'll cost a little bit more, but we'll have jobs. Let it take tariffs. I want to bring aluminum back into our country. These plants are all closing or closed. Recently, we put a tariff on washing machines because we were getting killed, believe it or not, on washing machines and solar panels. That was two months ago. You have to see the activity on new plants being built for washing machines and for solar panels. We had 32 solar panel plants. Of the 32, 30 were closed, and two were on life-to-life -life resuscitation. They were dead. Now, they're talking about opening up many of them, reopening plants that have been closed for a long time. And we make better solar panels than China. One of the knocks were that the solar panels were lousy. They weren't good. We make a much higher quality solar panel. So after two months, 
We're opening up at least five plants, and other plants are expanding on the washing machines, which, by the way, it sounds like sort of a little hokey to say washing machines. It's a big business. It's a very big business. But then you look and you see car, like, I won't mention, I won't mention countries. I would never do that. But how many Chevrolets are in the middle of Berlin? How many Fords are in the middle of Tokyo? Not too many. In fact, Ford sort of closed up their operation in Japan because they couldn't get cars in there. I spoke to Prime Minister Abe, another great friend of mine. He's a great person. But I said, listen, you're sending us millions of cars. And if we send you one, and if we make it so perfect, they actually told me a case where they made this car so good. This was, they spent a fortune. They had the best environmental, the best this, the best skins, the best everything you can have in a car, the best safety. They brought it in. And after inspections that lasted forever, it was rejected. You see, that's a form of tariff, too. Maybe that's a, a more deadly form of tariff. That, to me, is just as deadly as 50% and 25% and 100% in many cases. So we're going to straighten it out. We've already started. I mean, the first year is just we laid the seeds. You know, a lot of it is statutory where you can't do anything unless you go through a process. Well, now, through our great team, we've gone through that process. Many of this, in other words, you'll do a rule, you have to wait 90 days. That's sort of what's happening with the bump stocks. I'm waiting for the next process, but it's gone. Just don't worry about it. It's gone. Essentially gone, because we're going to make it so tough that you're not going to be able to get them. Nobody's going to want them anyway. You know, bump stocks, you shoot rapidly, but not accurately. I don't know if you have ever heard what a bump stock does. The bullets come out fast, but you don't know where the hell they're going. That's why nobody even really too much came to its defense. But, but he used it in Las Vegas. He was using bump stocks in Las Vegas, as you know. So we're getting rid of them. So you're going to ask questions. I'm going to help you folks. We're going to get all of the things that we want to do, whether it's transportation, whether it's safety, whether it's uh, law and order. One of the things that the past administration would not do is give this incredible equipment that we have, excess military equipment. Wouldn't give it to your police. Would not give it to your law enforcement. They didn't like the idea, the administration, of armored vehicles. I guess maybe they'd rather have you, you, you look. Why wouldn't they want that? People were in danger. People were being killed. People were being shot. People were being hit with rocks during some bad times in some rough places. And we've uh, given out hundreds of millions of dollars worth of our excess military equipment to your police forces. And I will tell you, every time I go to one of your cities, they come up to me, the police, and they say, thank you so much for that equipment. We feel so much safer. Where they can go in an armored van up to a site and not worry about being shot or hit in the head with a rock. And to me, it's common sense, but, you know. What can I tell you? But I, I will say this, your, your group really appreciates it. So with that, I'm going to ask Brian to say a couple of words, and then we'll go around. We'll take some questions. Maybe we'll have Rick Scott come up second. And I'm here as long as you need me. Let's, uh, let's get it all out. We want to help the governors. We want to help our states. And we want to make our schools safe. Brian, please. Mr. President, thank you. And I truly appreciate you. I appreciate all the members of the cabinet. On behalf of all the governors, I want to thank you for your hospitality and the First Lady's hospitality yesterday evening. It was an extraordinary night and truly a privilege to be able to um, visit and, and enjoy fellowship. Mr. President, I uh, appreciate again your having us all today. We can talk about issues with regard to infrastructure, workforce development, combating opioids, prison reform, agriculture, health care, workforce, all these different issues. And those are things that we all need to talk about. But the issue of the day is school safety, is public safety, Mr. President. Um, you know, I shared this last night, Mr. President, after the um, massacre in Las Vegas, the mass shooting, 
where we lost 58 people, over 500 people were injured. This was a person who used those bump stocks, and I personally want to thank you for taking action to eliminate those because it essentially was a killing field down there where we had 20,000 people who were simply helpless. And that is an important first step. You mentioned in your remarks school safety and public safety, and we need to have this national conversation with regard to what we're going to do. I suppose um, you were looking for some suggestions, some ideas, and uh, it'll come in the form of questions as well, but I would suggest, uh, Mr. President, with regard to the scope of the FBI background checks, if we could broaden those, Mr. President, because I know in my state, our background checks are much broader. Yeah. When we do an FBI background check, it does not include an adjudication of mental illness. It does not include an adjudication of a domestic violence protection order or a conviction for domestic violence. I think those are things that absolutely need to be included, and there are other categories that would be included in an expansion of FBI uh, background checks. We talked about this at dinner uh, with regard to Governor Scott, and again, my heart goes out to you and to the victims there in Florida and Texas and everywhere else uh, where this has happened. And it, we need to have this national conversation. We need to bring the strength, the wisdom of all the governors and everyone else across the country to have this conversation. Something else that we have done in Nevada with regard to school safety is I included in my budget more money for social workers in the schools. We've had shootings where we've had bullied students that didn't have access. We're going to cut in here right now because on the right hand side of your screen you can see Melania Trump, the first lady, is now making remarks at the governor's spouse's luncheon. While the governors there continue their conversation with the president, Melania is right now talking about guns and further gun control and safety in schools. Let's dip in and listen here. And respect in our children. With those values as a solid foundation, our kids will be better equipped to deal with many of the evils in our world today, such as drug abuse and addiction and negative social media interactions. In my role as First Lady, I want to nature, nurture and protect the most valuable part of our society and our future, children. I hope you will join me today in my, my efforts and ask for your support. My office will be reaching out to many of you in the future as we travel the country and work to promote and fight for the well-being of our children. Thank you all for being here today and thank you for all that you do for your home states and territories. God bless each of you and your families and God bless the United States of America. Wrapping up her remarks there at the White House. Now let's go back to the conversation with the governors along with the president and Rick Scott from Florida. Governor Rick Scott is now speaking. Let's listen in. You've gone to the funeral of a 14-year-old girl that um, her parents just loved her. You know that you have to make a change. So what we've done in the last, I guess it's a little less than two weeks, we've looked at what other governors have done. We've brought people together. I'm very appreciative of what the president's done by bringing us all together to talk about this and also what he did last week by bringing people together because it's created uh, momentum to make sure something happens this time, that we don't go through this and nothing happen. So in our state, the way I've done this is I've broken down into three things. Num number one, we're going to have school safety. No parent in our state is going to say, I'm concerned whether my child can go to school safely. If you go to school in Florida, you're going to know that your child can come home safely. If you're a teacher, if you work in one of these schools, you're going to know you're going to come home safely. That's step one. We're going to spend $500 million. I have two weeks left in my legislative session. I'm not waiting for the federal government. We're going to invest $500 million. We're going to have a significant law enforcement presence at every public school in our state. We are going to, we've already been investing dollars in, um, in hardening our schools. We're not only going to invest a lot more state dollars, but we're going to say any local dollars that go to capital outlay by our school districts, the first thing all those dollars have to be sent, spent on is har school hardening. It's the most important thing we can do is harden these schools. 
So we're going to do it. Number two, and, and by the way, the way it's going to happen is our sheriffs are going to oversee how all the money is spent to make sure that the money is spent the right way. There will be a plan annually and the money will be spent the right way. Number two, mental illness. We're going to have mental health counselors in every school to make sure that all of our students can go through counseling or meet with a mental health counselor as often as they want. We're going to do it. We're also going to have threat assessment teams. Virginia did that after um, their shooting. We're going to have that in all of our schools where you'll have uh, children, families, juvenile justice, teachers, principals, local law enforcement all together and say, what's it, what are the threat assessments in our schools? We're going to do that. Next, we're going to invest more dollars in mental health in our children and families program. We do that around our state, but we're going to invest more dollars to make sure we have youth uh, teams all around our state to help them. Finally, we're not going to have, you're not going to Florida have access to a gun. If, you, if you're struggling with mental illness, are you going to make violent threats? You're not going to have access to a gun in our state. You shouldn't have access to a gun, and you're not. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to have a, um, a violent th threat restraining order that a family member, a mental health um, individual, or law enforcement can go to the court system. It'll be, there'll be a due process but they can make sure that you don't have access to a gun. If you've been involuntarily uh, committed uh, because you're a threat to yourself or others, you will not have access to a gun. You'll have to give that, those guns up. There'll be due process, you can get those guns back, but we're gonna make sure that doesn't happen. We're gonna make sure as you do background checks, all this information is out there so we can make sure we know who has the guns. So in our state, we are going to uh, get all this done. I'm going to get it done in the next two weeks. I've been talking to my uh, legislative leadership uh, every day. They're committed to be, uh, to be a partner. But in Florida, I want to make sure every parent knows that their child is going to come home safe and sound every day. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, Brian, very much. Great job you've done, too. Is Chairman, thank you. Uh, Kay, would you like to say, I think I can bring this over. It might be easier just to pass this around. Kay? Thank you, Mr. President. Like you, I believe that the local officials have an awful lot of insight into what each school needs to provide public, uh, 